Good evening Year 3, we're back with uh, Chapter 6 tonight. I just wanted to ask you what you thought of the book so far. So if you are enjoying it, or if you're not enjoying it, or can you make any predictions about what you might happen? Um, is there any particular characters that you should be wary of already, or um, that you think might become suspicious as we move through. Um, I'd love, love, love to hear your comments because if we were in the classroom, I know that loads of you would have your hands up and you would be asking me questions and you would be telling me what you think might happen. So if you'd like to email me any comments that you've got about the book so far, then that would be great. And um, I can't wait to read back, be back in the classroom and read to you in person because it's not very much fun reading to a computer screen. It's very strange. So I hope you're enjoying it um, and I look forward to reading to you in person again soon. Okay, chapter six, Born to Rule. Tostig's private chamber was a large room at the top of the palace. On one side was a bed covered with furs and on the other was a wide window. The shutters were open and Magnus could see the city laid out below. The dull glow of torches here and there, like the last sparks of a dying hearth fire. Tostig helped Magnus out of his mail shirt and ordered the servants to bring food and drink. Magnus asked after his aunt, Tostig's wife. Judith and their sons, Scully and Kettle, both younger than him. It's not safe here for my family, said Tostig, looking uneasy. I've sent them to London in the care of King Edward. I'll let them come back when things have settled down. He paused and he turned to Magnus and smiled. I know why you've come to York, Magnus. Magnus froze, a chunk of meat wrapped in bread halfway to his mouth. He had been worrying about this moment since he left Sussex, wondering if he could lie to his uncle and get away with it. Now, it seemed Tostig had seen through him before he'd even had a chance to try. Your father and I haven't always been the best of friends, Tostig went on. In fact, I'd say we've been rivals since we could barely talk. Did I ever tell you about the time he tried to drown me in the duck pond at Bossom? It was our mother who saved me. She gave your father such a beating, it almost turned his backside blue. Uh, I, I, I can imagine said Magnus, unsure of why his uncle was suddenly talking about the past. But at least this was more like the Tostig that he remembered than the raging lord of earlier. Magnus knew his father and Tostig had sometimes argued. It happened in all families, though, and it seemed to not matter much. And both Harold and Tostig got on well with their other brothers, Gwerth and Leofwine. But I have to hand it to him, said Tostig, smiling. This is all part of your education, isn't it? Harold has sent you here so I can teach you how to rule an earldom. Well, maybe he didn't realise it, but you couldn't have come at a better time. This is where you'll learn that ruling isn't easy. Magnus relaxed, relieved that he wouldn't have to lie after all, and crushed a twinge of guilt. He was doing this for his uncle as well as his father, wasn't he? I think I already know that, he said, and put the meat and bread in his mouth. But you don't know how bad it can be. Tostig went over to the window and looked down on the city. I tried to be the kind of ruler people love, he said softly. But there are those in the north that have always wanted me to fail. And the old Viking families who once ruled in Northumbria and that evil wretch Edwin of Mercia and his foul brother Morcar, they have turned the people's hearts against me. The names were familiar to Magnus from conversations with his father. Edwin was Earl of Mercia, a powerful man with plenty of ambition. He had struck an alliance with Grufford of Gwened and married his own sister, Algith, off to him. But Grufford was dead, killed by Magnus's father two years ago. 
So perhaps Edwin no longer favoured the Godwins. It seemed he had clearly turned his attention to the Northumbria now, and if he seized control of the North, he would become a real threat. This isn't the Archbishop, right? said Magnus. Aren't you making things worse? I've seen what your men are doing. We passed a burnt farm on the way here. Tostig turned round, his face suddenly hard. What would you have me do, Magnus? I am the Earl, yet the people do not obey me. I don't know, Uncle, but surely there must be some other way. Only the way of the weak. Eldred wants me to meet Edwin and Morcar and the rest of our and the rest to sort out our differences. But that's not what a great ruler does. The tide will turn in my favour. I am certain of it. A ruler always has to stay strong. Even if it means killing your own people. Magnus fell silent, worried that he had gone too far. Tostig stared at him for a moment, and then he laughed. <laughs> I can see that you've still got plenty of learning to do, Magnus. We are the Godwins, and they are peasants. We are born to rule over others, although occasionally we have to kill a few to make them understand that. And we always win, even when the odds are stacked against us. I will show you how it's done. Magnus tried to smile, but he wasn't sure. He wanted to know. Over the next two days, Magnus spent a lot of time with his uncle. Tostig took him on a tour of the city, showed him how well the walls were defended and introduced him to the commanders, including the man who had spoken at the gatehouse, whose name turned out to be Gisli. Everywhere they went, Tostig was loud and cheerful, laughing and slapping backs, keeping his anger only for those who brought him bad news. It wasn't till the third day that Magnus had a chance to check in on his own men. They were doing weapons practice in the courtyard beneath a warm sun, training in pairs with sword and shield. Hakon was standing at the side, observing. Glad to see you're keeping them busy, Magnus said, smiling. He felt a little nervous remembering how angry he had been with Hakon at the gatehouse when they arrived. Things had changed since then, and however much Magnus hated the idea, he had to admit that Hakon was probably right about his uncle Tostig. Hakon turned to look at Magnus and returned his smile. There's not much else to do, he said. We went to a few of the taverns, but I've been, but I've been to burials that were more cheerful. The people aren't very friendly. Mm, I can understand that, said Magnus. They probably think we're the same as my uncle's bought men, and this gives them good reason to hate us. Magnus told Hakon what he had discovered. He felt he would burst if he didn't tell someone, and he trusted the house cow. Hakon listened in silence, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Hmm, Edward and Morkai, you say, he murmured at last. That would explain a lot. They're more dangerous than a barrel full of snakes and trickier too. This is burning farms, but is burning farms the right way to deal with them? Well, that depends on whether it works or not. I've seen it tried by other lords in trouble. If you burn enough farms and kill enough people, the rest might start to think it would be better to do what you want. But dead farmers don't pay taxes and it's dangerous to rely on bought men. What if Edward and Morcar offer them more money to switch sides? Then your uncle would be finished. I'm very sorry about that noise, Jeffrey. There's a toy. <laughs> Can you hear it? We'll just try and ignore it. Okay. Magnus left him after a while and found a quiet spot where he could think. A small square with a great oak at its heart. He sat on the bench beneath the tree and went over everything in his mind. 
He was sure his father would want Tostig to defeat Edwin and Morcar, and if Haken was right, then Tostig didn't really have much choice in how to fight them. Magnus might not like what Tostig was doing, but what if the tide was truly turning in his favour? There was only one way to find out. Magnus realised he should escape from this miserable city, go and talk to the people in the farms and villages, ask them what they thought. That's what his father would expect him to do, he was certain. He hurried back to his palace, decided that he would say his men needed proper exercise, so he'd take them on a short patrol into the countryside. I don't see why not, said Tostig. There's more patrols we send out, the better, but I can't let you go with just a handful of men. That would be too dangerous. Your father would never forgive me. If I returned you to him without the handsome Godwin head of yours, then I'd be in trouble. You'd better take 50 of my men along with you. Magnus tried to argue, but his uncle was stubborn and wouldn't listen. At dawn the next morning, Magnus and Hakon and the house cars were sitting at their horses in the street that led them to the gatehouse. They were ready, sunlight flashing off their helmets and spear blades and iron bosses on their shields. The horses snickered impatiently, as keen as their riders to move out. But Tostig's men were taking ages to get organised, most of them yawning, barely awake. At last they were ready too, and their commander, Gisli trotted his horse over to Magnus. Morning, lads, he said with a grin, speaking in Danish. As this is your patrol, it's only fair that you should take the lead. My men and I will ride right behind you. I'd rather you were in front, growled Hakon, where I can see you. It doesn't matter, Hakon, said Magnus. He spurred his horse forward and they clattered out through the open gates. The road stretched ahead towards the sun but Magnus could see a mass of dark clouds gathering in the distance.